Colorado Backcountry Discovery Route is brought to you by the following sponsors. Touratech, the leading brand in aftermarket accessories for large touring and adventure motorcycles. Venture riders have relied on Touratech products to explore some of the most remote locations on Earth. Whether you're setting up your bike for a weekend ride or a trip around the world, Touratech is your dedicated resource for adventure touring solutions. Climb Technical Apparel, the leader in high-performance, all-conditioned riding gear. Climb builds products for the motorcyclist who demands quality and reliable performance in extreme conditions. Climb supports the Backcountry Discovery Route series because they're riders who have a passion for projects that enhance our sport and our community. Butler Motorcycle Maps. Our mission is simple, to make it easy for riders to find the best roads and destinations. Butler Motorcycle Maps give riders confidence in their journey and the roads they choose so that when they swing a leg over their bike, they trust their experience will be as good as it can be. Backcountry discovery routes are unique and foster a special motorcycling experience, one that Butler Maps is extremely proud to be part of. BMW Motorcycle Owners of America, dedicated to making the experience of owning a BMW motorcycle more enjoyable by promoting the bonds that motorcyclists share. Our mission is to foster communication and a sense of family among BMW motorcycle enthusiasts, and we're proud to be a sponsor of the Backcountry Discovery Route Series. My name is Paul Gillian. I'm the president of the Backcountry Discovery Routes nonprofit organization. We're out here in Colorado creating a route across the state for the Colorado Backcountry Discovery Route. For this trip, I'm riding a Yamaha Super Tenere. I'm Tom Myers. I'm the owner of Touratech USA. I'm riding a 2011 BMW R1200GS. Hi, I'm Rob Watt, and um, I'm from Monument, Colorado. I'm riding a KTM 990. My name is Justin Bradshaw. I am one of the owners of Butler Motorcycle Maps, and we make maps for all sorts of motorcycle adventures, and uh, the BDRs are now one of them. I'm Jason Wickenkamp, and I work with Climb USA. Climb is a company that's all about passion, and so adventure motorcycling fits right into the niche of products that we make, because adventure motorcycling is all about passion and passionate people. Well, my name is Bryce Stevens, and I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I'm here to join the team to verify this amazing route across Colorado. John Beck, I'm a professional photographer, really enjoy motorcycling and adventure riding, and I'm along on this trip to take care of all the still images for media and commercial use. I'm Sterling Noreen from Noreen Films. I'm riding a F800 GS and I'm looking forward to uh, starting this ride tomorrow. I'm Tony Hugel from Idaho Falls, Idaho, and uh, I rode down from Idaho to Colorado on my Kawasaki KLR650 to chronicle the evolving story of backcountry discovery routes because I think adventure motorcycling is one of the most dynamic, most exciting new chapters in exploring the American West that uh, I've encountered in many years. The Colorado Backcountry Discovery Route is the third one in the series. The first one we created was across the state of Washington, the second one was across the state of Utah, and now we're doing the third one which is across the state of Colorado. Well the purpose of this route is to create a great one-week off-road excursion that uh, anybody can do on a dual sport or adventure motorcycle. We have uh, free GPS tracks that people can download on the internet. We have a Butler motorcycle map that's made, uh, it's purpose built just for this route. It has the gas stops, the mileage, the elevation, the uh, points of interest and everything. So it's a great planning tool and so our mission is to create this route and just turn it over to the community uh, for free.
for this trip, we've got a team of industry people. We've got some volunteers for the Backcountry Discovery Routes project. We've got two local guys here from the state of Colorado. So we're here in their backyard. They've been working on this route for about 18 months, scouting a little bit last year and then intensive scouting this year. And so they are showing us the best that this state has to offer for adventure touring motorcycles and dual sport travel. We're starting here in the four corners of uh, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. Uh, one of the reasons we picked this as our starting point is that foreigners or people who are not from around this area uh, will recognize the name for Four Corners. So if you say the Colorado Backcountry Discovery Route is starting in the Four Corners, most people will know where that's at. It's also a great transition spot uh, for the Arizona Backcountry Discovery Route and the Utah Backcountry Discovery Route. The, route. the Arizona one ends in uh, around Page and the Utah one starts in Mexican Hat. So that's not too far from here and uh, so it makes a really good transition point so you can do whichever way you want to go and, uh, and that's why we're starting here. We're in an Indian reservation. This is the Navajo reservation. And then as soon as we get out of here, uh, we're, we leave here and you get into the Ute Mountain reservation. The scenery is, is very unique. It's kind of a, a deserty plains, but yet there's these big monuments. So as you're riding out of here, uh, you've got this great, beautiful landscape and then these monuments that are sticking up and it's, it's really quite pretty. I think Colorado is a destination for a lot of people as it is. They, they know it for areas like this in the Four Corners where we are. Doing a project like the BDR will just help get people into the backcountry to explore Colorado in places they might not go otherwise. And you can get across the whole state, stay off the road and have a good time and be safe about it. And that's what we're trying to do. The beginning of the trip started roughly the same latitude that our Utah run did. So it was somewhat similar right off the bat, but immediately we started climbing. And once you get into the mountains, you get into these amazing aspen forests. Um, you don't see stuff like that in Utah. So right off the bat, we were treated to some uh, very uniquely Colorado visuals. So we're at this store here, but they don't serve any hot food and no one has any food. So they're relying on me to uh, do a little shopping. So I am going with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the entire crew. One of the cool elements of the backcountry discovery routes is that's part of our mission is to help drive traffic and tourism to these towns from adventure motorcyclists and to give uh, an infusion of, of dollars to some of these communities that are struggling to, to keep businesses open. As long as they're there, it allows people like us to come out and explore this because there are gas stations and food. If those places go away, it'll really make it a lot harder to experience the backcountry. So far this day has just been full of just a lot of beautiful scenery, a lot of great riding, lots of different terrain. I'm hoping we can get camp set up, get a nice little sprinkle, and prep for a really good day tomorrow. I'm impressed at how accessible the Colorado Backcountry Discovery Route makes the wildlands, the beauty, the natural environment of Colorado to people like me who may need help in, in seeing where to go, how to do it, what it takes to do it safely, responsibly, and just have great, bring home great memories from the experience. You know, this is my first time doing a long trip on motorcycles and camping off of motorcycles, so this was the biggest challenge for me was what to bring, how do I pack, and what, what exactly is the right list? And, and Paul sent me over a list from Tour Tech, and, and they've been revising that and getting it closer and closer, so that was really helpful. Go with the good stuff, first of all. I wouldn't recommend just swinging by Target and picking up a cheap tent and all that stuff because it's gonna fall apart. You, go, you camp in spots like this where it's not necessarily a camp spot, it's just a cool place that we found and there's twigs and stuff everywhere and you wake up every morning and, and there's, there's dew and water. So, so I would say don't skimp on the sleeping bag or the tent. Getting up here and, and setting up the tent uh, while it was dry and then having an amazing rain and lightning show put on for us that evening was a, was a great experience.
Okay, so today's camp, or tonight, we're gonna head um, over and, uh, let me start this. So if you're doing the Colorado Backcountry Discovery Route or any of the Backcountry Discovery Routes, hopefully you've got a good team of people with you. Well, there's a few weak links for sure. Paul, Jason, obviously John Beck is just learning to ride, so we're giving him some, some time to get used to it. Uh, but, but aside from those guys, and guys that crash and slow us all down, but other than that, it's pretty good. Justin Bradshaw is, is one of the funnier guys on our crew. First night of camping, it rained and I had to take a really bad dump. Constantly has me uh, laughing. Justin Bradshaw is a guy that can turn the throttle and he also loves to camp and make good food. Bradshaws will feed you. They'll cook, the amazing cook. So bring the Bradshaw, it's worth the extra tube. You know, you'll want to rob Watt because Rob really had, did a phenomenal job laying out a lot of the trails and just kind of being the, it's kind of everybody's dad in a way. It's kind of keeping everybody on track, keeping everybody in line, but but in a nice fatherly sort of way. Sorry, Rob, if I'm making you sound old. Hey, no laughing from the peanut gallery. Paul Gillian, he's kind of the, the ringleader of this group. The guy's like at the helm and you, you don't quite see him until he's like telling everybody which way we're going and how we're going. And then it's just like, okay, aye aye, Captain, here we go. That cocksucker, I tell you what, you can ride a Yamaha pretty well. Tom was, uh, Tom's kind of, you know, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have a good one. Next. Tom, Mr. Smooth. He, he's awesome because he's such a good writer and he's got so much history and so much skill. He's kind of like the scientist of the group in a way, you know what I mean? He kind of knows about all the different plants and knows about how to look out for poison ivy and knows like, you know, weather patterns and satellite patterns. I mean, he, he's just, it, it, was, it was great. And he can wheelie the hell out of a big motorcycle, which I have a lot of respect for. Most people probably wouldn't immediately peg Tom for a wheelie guy, but yes. I've got the photos to prove it. So I'm riding the KTM 990 Adventure. When I first got on the bike, um, I don't think I gave it quite the respect that it needed. I, I've learned to respect the bike a lot more since I started riding it. If you have a Bryce on your team, you, you want to be careful because he'll probably blow a motor if you let him go off on his own, just, just rallying. Where, where Tom takes the wheelie award, I think Bryce takes the burnout award. So if, you're, if you want to find him in a crowd of people, just look for the most dust and, and listen for the motor, and then you can pick Bryce up. Tony, he was a full-time journalist. He's authored books. He's written countless uh, magazine articles, and we're lucky enough that he's going to be writing an article for Roadrunner magazine. I really look forward to reading it. For about 20 years now, I've been... Uh, <clears throat> Let me start over again. <clears throat> start over again. Yeah, that, no, that's like, oh, fine, okay. Oh, I lost my train of thought. Let me start over. And then, of course, our, our crew members, as far as, you know, Sterling doing the video and, and John doing all the photos, I mean, those guys are amazing. John Beck is the man. I'm on a BMW R1200 GS Adventure. It holds 50 gallons of gas, speaks four languages, and weighs as much as a small moon. That's probably not what I should say. Sterling's an interesting fella. He's a filmmaker, so you know you kind of have to go with every little personality that he brings to the table every day. You just don't know if it's going to be, you know, uh, Sterling or Sterling. You know, great guy to have along and and uh, a lot of fun. You know, the low point of this trip for me was the altitude sickness because it changed my perception of everything I did for the first few, few days. It was always there and always gnawing at me. Uh, altitude sickness is something you're definitely gonna have to worry about on the um, uh, Colorado Backcountry Discovery Route. And a lot of those symptoms are first starting with a headache, uh, then shortness of breath, um, and then it eventually you'll become nauseated um, and uh, so at some point, get delirious so much that you just don't know what's going on. One of the quickest ways to help them is to drop them a thousand to two thousand feet from where you are and uh, they'll start to feel a little better but making sure that they get plenty of liquids um, and uh, give them some Tylenol as soon as they get there um, as long as they can take that uh, but um, that's uh, something you really do have to worry about. All right well we'll test it. All right. Let's see how I feel. Hopefully Telluride. I'll get rid of this headache. Yeah that's yeah, that, that'll be the big test. 
Have you like... taken some Tylenol yet? I did. I okay. took some Tylenol this Good. morning. It hasn't kicked in, though. The headache's still there. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see. All righty. Good deal. There was that headache and that persistent nagging feeling. And uh, I didn't expect to have that happen. I live at sea level, but I still didn't expect that to happen. I've been at high altitude many, many times, and that was very frustrating. So that was clearly the low, low point for me. We did have to send Bryce down to lower altitude a little early, um, which was unfortunate, but uh, he started feeling much better once he got down to lower altitude. So that worked out really well in our favor. We're leaving today uh, from just above Telluride and gonna drop down into Telluride and then go up over Ophir Pass. Um, we don't wanna go up over the big passes late in the day uh, because there's a lot of people coming down off those mountains and late in the afternoon the traffic gets a little hard so try to schedule your trip where you're going up early in the morning. If you look at those jagged peaks over there that's where we're going to be riding. We're going to be riding around those and that's Ophir Pass. That'll be your first chance to really get to see what tomorrow is going to be like. After Telluride, we went winding up this beautiful canyon to Ophir Pass. It's kind of a signature moment for the BDRs where you're, you're going up this alpine valley and you can kind of feel the temperature drop and it gets a little bit of a breeze and you know you're going up to the high country. It's really a, a fun moment and it did not disappoint. It was rocky and rugged and went way up over this pass. For me, I was on the Tenere and I had the traction control system on and the, the rocks were so big and they were slipping so much that, the, AB, that the, uh, the traction control kept cutting off the power. Once I shut the traction control off, then it was, it was great again. So beautiful descent from there and then really the roads just kept getting better and better. It's a good warm up for the other passes. Um, you get a little bit of rock, you get some switchback, uh, you get some of the side hill that you're gonna see on the next day going over Corkscrew and, and California and into Cinnamon. What I learned on this trip was the importance of exercise and judgment and being honest with yourself about what your riding level is, what your skill level is, what your bike is capable of doing. Tony was always bringing up the, bringing up the rear, man. He was, uh, he was our steady, steady anchor at the end. Tony was our litmus test for this one. He was, he, he, we call him sort of target market Tony. He is, a, you know, average guy, new to the sport, just getting into it. He, he rides, a, you know, an average motorcycle. He's not on a very sophisticated, expensive, you know, $20,000 bike like some of the rest of us are lucky enough to ride. For us, it was important to have him along just to see how a, a regular guy on an average bike does. And uh, it, was, it was a challenge for him. He did have a few tip overs. We took him on some terrain that was on the upper edge of what he was comfortable with. And on a couple occasions, we sent him on the, the easy workarounds. But that's part of how we designed the routes. We want it to be the average guy can make it, but if the average guy is not feeling it that day or, or he looks at something and says, you know, I don't feel comfortable with that, we provide him with an easier alternate. So that's a good opportunity for a guy to do a workaround if he's just really not feeling it that day. Once we got over Ophir, we had to get back on a little bit of pavement to the top of Red Mountain Pass. When we got to the top of Red Mountain Pass, we take a little side chute 
into an old uh, gold mining town, which was really, really fun. There's a highway that goes nearby and then there's this little rugged road that goes to this place that's way out of the way and it was really cool. It was a, it was a window into the past of this, this whole area which has uh, really got a mining history. Well, tonight we're staying in a hotel in Ure, and it's not uncommon to be in a situation where even if you're camping, you want to stay for a night in a hotel. All of the backcountry discovery routes are designed so that there are camp spots along the routes and there are hotels at, at good distances to allow somebody to stay in hotels the entire trip if they want to do that. One thing that you'll need to know about this area is that there's not a lot of campsites in and around Uray. Um, the, the, the mountains are too steep and they're just not available. That's why we chose a, um, a motel here in town tonight. Uh, it's a nice little motel. Uh, there's several in here in town, so that's where we are, is enjoying our stay here at the motel. We're gonna probably get in the hot springs, hot tubs after this and enjoy the evening. So you must be feeling pretty bummed right now. Well, you know what? I have two blown fork seals and a flat tire, but I think that if you expect nine guys to ride all the way across the state off-road and not a single flat happen, then we'd be fooling ourselves, so. I guess I'm fine that I'm the guy. It's a quick fix, new tube. It was a pinch flat, so there's nothing in it. I just got pinched somehow. You come into cool towns like you right here, and it's kind of hard to pass up a warm shower and a clean bed. So as soon as I'm done, I'm gonna walk down and get a beer and I'm gonna bring it back and sit in the hot springs that's conveniently located behind our hotel room. So it's not so bad. Kinda wanna watch out for the Justin Bradshaws cause they're gonna steal your tubes and your socks and uh, what else did he take of mine? <laughs> We just left Ure, Colorado, and we're heading up the, the notorious Corkscrew Pass. So if the beginning's any indication, it's gonna be very challenging and technical way up and over this pass. All right, so what we've gone through so far is just kind of a little warm up uh, corkscrew. The switchbacks are steep coming in and steep going out. So you wanna keep your momentum, maybe stay on the outside, and, and there's good barrels on the outside so you can kind of ride the rail and go around and then take your momentum because it gets steep right out of the corkscrew. This route, I kind of purposely chose things that are gonna be challenging, but yet most of the route is just a, a great way to get in the outdoors and on the back country. You know, you're gonna have some easy stuff, you're gonna have some challenging stuff, and um, you're gonna have some stuff that you're gonna just be sitting there riding along Handlebar, hands on your handlebars and just going, wow. The corkscrew is unique because of the hill in the distance. When we crested the hill looking back, there was a whole section of the mountain that was pure color. There was vegetation here and there on, on spots off to the sides, but the middle of it was just this amazing swath of color and then there'd be a, a tree patch over here, but it was just unlike anything I'd seen so far, at least on this trip. Just by walking around the corner and turning about 40, 50 degrees or so, totally different type of terrain. So it's pretty amazing. After we came over Corkscrew Pass, we were coming down and uh, I was leading and there was a kind of a sharp downhill left hand turn. Jason was coming down and, and uh, took the outside line. There was some loose rocks and apparently grabbed a bit too much front brake and unfortunately fell into that drop off. 
At eight frames a second, it looked pretty ugly, possibly uglier than it actually was. I ended up rolling onto the top of my, uh, my radial head, which is, you know, the radial bone, the head that goes into the elbow. Um, and in doing that, I, I cracked it. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to send that to the hospital, the uh, crash sequence, so they know exactly what happened. But the bike was upside down, sliding for a little bit, and he got pinned underneath it. And All's well that ends well. He's currently at a hospital right now. I think he had pictures taken in Lake City. Um, so we haven't heard details yet, but he did ride the bike all the way from the crash site here with a broken clutch perch that was uh, zip-tied by Justin, so it was modified, got, it, got him all the way here. He was able to ride, so whatever injuries he had, um, he was still able to ride afterwards, so hopefully that's a good sign. Zip ties and duct tape. If you can't fix it with zip ties, duct tape, or JB Weld, you're hosed. Little things like that will, will save the day, because it was really a non-issue. It was just five minutes, zip ties, and we're good to go again. The thing that I'm looking forward to most about this trip is the really high elevation roads. Most of today we've been around eight to 10,000 feet and we are gonna go a lot higher than that. We're gonna be somewhere in the 12 to 13,000 foot elevation range. And so I'm a little nervous about that, but at the same time, I'm really excited to see what things look like way up that high. You know, our route makers have chosen a route that keeps us high in the mountains and, and rising and, and dropping into valleys. It's just. It's mind-blowing that you can put together a, a BDR like this, but we're lucky enough to have that. This route, going over the high passes, you should be an, an amateur level, not a novice. I don't, I don't think it's a novice level to go over these passes. They're rocky and they're loose and they're occupied by a lot of other tourists and Jeeps. There's Jeep rental agencies in every town next to one of these passes, so you can be sure that there's people up there who don't really know how to encounter motorcycles coming the other way. It's actually not as intrusive as you might think it would be having all those Jeeps around, because uh, everybody's just kind of moving along and you get spots where you'll just have vistas forever and not see anybody, so you get these moments like you're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but the scenery is just so unbelievable. And that really is Colorado at its finest there. As we move further north, it's gonna be less crowded like that. We'll be in more remote areas that not as many tourists goes, but it's cool to see both. I mean, you have to go down there and see that. That's a pretty unique part of the Colorado BDR. Going next, just kind of show we're, us. We're going to kind of go over Cinnamon Pass yeah. and then down this and into Lake City. Okay. And then from there, we're going to kind of fuel up and get supplies, and then we're going to head out this direction, either to camp this. in here or we're going to be camping over here. You know. Well, Rob Watt is a, a very important and integral part of this team, but for this trip specifically in Colorado, this was his doing. I mean, he spent so much time researching this. And every time we ask him a question about why didn't you go this way or why didn't you go this way, he says, because of this or because of that. He already knows that he's narrowed it down to the best way through this state. You might see 10,000 dirt roads on a map, but they don't all go through. They end up private roads. They, are, they aren't all accessible on a, on a motorcycle. So to filter it out and then stitch together something that makes sense and is fun and, you know, like I said, meets our goals as, as a group, is really hard to do, really hard to do. I spent so many months scouting and planning and, and trying to find the little offshoots that uh, you're gonna take on the, on the route. And um, you're gonna see a little bit of everything that Colorado has, has to offer from the southern part of the state to the northern part of the state. Right now, we're, we're in the heart of the historic mining area of Colorado. There are mines and, and evidence of, of mines from, from decades gone past all over the place. You see the old rail systems, you see the trussels, you see carts, you see all these old structures just built on the sides of hills. It's really everywhere. We were able to find this really nice, twisty, very remote road that went to an old mining uh, complex that was dilapidated and falling down, but we were able to ride motorcycles around it and take some photos and kind of explore and just think about what some of these communities were like 100 years ago. Getting 
from town to town and seeing the things in between that you wouldn't see if you were on a paved road that everybody else is seeing. That's really the highlight. I mean, I've seen things in this trip in my own backyard that I didn't know were there. There were parts of today where I literally felt like I went back in time. I felt like we had just walked completely away from everything that is, you know, that encompasses our lives and just went back 150 years. And it was just us and nature and, you know, it was just, it was phenomenal. Just no one else was around. It was, it was great. Some years ago, I lived a hard life. I, I had the opportunity to ride first in the group through a very fun uphill section. And I was really zipping along. I mean, I'm honestly, I was uh, just having fun. There were, I, I had clear visibility and there were no cars in front of me. And I was just ripping it. Uh, I get up to top and there is a ranger with a four by four vehicle with red and blue lights on top looking for speedy speeders. Uh, and then I promptly grabbed him and started distracting him while the rest of the team zoomed up the same section that I did. You know, you can get in trouble by, for speeding up here when it's 15 mile an hour speed limit. It's very hard to hold yourself back and, and go that speed. I can tell when Bryce is getting antsy. He's like, can we go ahead? You know, what, what's up there? What, what if we just go check it out a little bit? And he's, so he's always willing to go scout something or have an excuse to spin it up a little bit or jump off a water bar. So I'm waiting for a big crash one of these days and that'll add some epicness to one of these trips but so far he's a he's a character he's got his opinions and i appreciate that for sure we didn't travel a lot of miles today but we covered uh, some amazing terrain and five different passes it's hard to top this kind of riding uh, both the riding fun part of it and the scenery combined i thought the colorado backcountry discovery route is certainly the best of the three routes that we've done so far and it's something that we expected because uh, Colorado being you know the high having the highest mountains in the whole country has got to have the most the highest viewpoints and the most beautiful views so it wasn't any surprise how good it was but uh, actually seeing it is another thing I mean that that's confirms it comparing this section of this BDR to other BDRs that I've ridden and seen, uh, mind blowing. You don't see that stuff in, in other BDRs, other places. So uh, it is a real highlight. If anybody's considering doing a BDR, they should definitely put this one high on the list. Oh, look at this, another 990. Oh, there you go. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. That is a handful. <laughs> How you doing? made it, so I'm doing good. Yeah. Where are you guys from? Canada. John. Yeah. John. Right now, I'm glad I'm on this little guy. Yeah. Because uh, I was cussing on the highway coming down, uh, but uh, right now, it's fantastic. Have you guys looked at the uh, TAT maps at all for Colorado? I have. You want to take a peek at them? We'll According to the Cinnamon the Pass. Right Should keep it up. So this is heading, you know, it's up over in this direction here. Cinnamon Pass, that's us yeah, right that's, there, right? Yeah, that's, that's where we are here. It's a little ghost town. Fork screw, so we came up there. We're going to be going that. Yeah, you're reversing what we just did. Yeah, that's well, the whole day was amazing, but in particular, what stood out in my mind was the descent from Cinnamon to uh, Lake City. Uh, easily top five uh, rides I've ever done anywhere in the world. Um, views were singular, one of a kind. The terrain was amazing. Um, I was on a GS, and that road is essentially built for that bike. So uh, as a photographer, it was incredible. It was a, actually probably one of the toughest sections I've had to deal with simply because you want to stop every four feet to get another photo. Every single view you looked at, no matter where you were, was a postcard. Right after I broke my arm, um, we got to the bottom down there in the Lake City and we we're at a, a pizza joint having some lunch and we finally got some cell service and I turned on my phone and I had gotten a video from my wife videotaping the ultrasound of our first, our first baby. You know, seeing my firstborn kid uh, coming from my wife, that was, was pretty awesome. Pretty excited about that. Colorado has been fantastic to us. You know, we've had a few little storms, but you know, for the most part, we've been able to get through everything. We haven't had to stop because of rain or anything like that. And so uh, it's been good. It's been a really good trip.
anybody who rides a motorcycle knows that you're out there, you're in the elements, and it could rain depending on what time of year you go. It could be 90 degrees down here, it could be snowing up there. And when you're on a bike, you're in it. You, you have to experience all that and you have to deal with it. So we're prepared and hopefully that comes across in the video and everything we're doing so that guys see that there, there's ways you can do this and be safe and dry and, and have a good time and be out in the elements on the bike. Which is a traditional ball race with these sticks and they run for 24 hours through the night. offshoot on one of the trails and a little a little wet so it made it a little tougher but uh, I enjoy the challenging sections um, you know rocky loose rutted two track kind of stuff really fun for me I got a little wet on that showboat episode but uh, it was kind of fun we, we talk about this a lot on the BDRs, is that we, I don't think a, a novice rider, somebody who just buys a motorcycle, should take off on one of these things, ever. Because it's it's not a great training ground. You need to you need to work your way up to a BDR, because we, we go into remote areas where the roads are, are rough and, and the scenery is incredible like this. It's kind of an intermedi intermediate thing. And so yesterday and the day before, it was, they're all the same. They're not novice novice trails. If you look back over here, you'll see this little mud puddle, a small mud puddle, but wet nevertheless. And as soon as I went through it, my front end started to go right a little bit. Then my back end was in front of my front end. And I just stepped off and let her slide. Mr. Watts, we call him Mr. Speedy. No, we don't. <laughs> He's not a fast rider. Rob is steady and smooth. You will not see him bent out of shape because he won't get there. We counted how many bags he had in Utah. That was nine. Nine bags on his motorcycle. If, if every time you stop, you have to F around with nine bags, <laughs> you have too many bags. Yeah, that's broke. What's broken? The latch, which is pretty typical. See how the, huh? but we'll see if we can't latch it on. You're here though. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were worried we weren't going to catch you, you know, till later, like tomorrow. Yeah. Somewhere around Leadville or something. Well, that's what I thought. I thought I'd give it two days yeah. to kind of kind of heal up because I was like, hey, you know, if it's just a pinched nerve, it'll all be, you know, two days of rest. Still a little bit. If I like really jack on it hard, right. then it, it, it hurts a little bit. But if I ride easy, grit with my knees. Well, and today it's going to be a little easier. This afternoon is yeah. high speed stuff, so yeah. you'll do fine. Good yeah. deal. Yeah. I'm glad Welcome you're back. back. We missed you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah. Missed you guys, too. This afternoon, we're going to go back up high again, like we were in the beginning of the state. We're going to go up on Cumberland Pass uh, and then down into the town of Taylor Park or the area of Taylor Park. Um, and just some really good stuff. We'll have a couple of deep water crossings, and uh, it'll be a good day. saying for some time that is the best twisty asphalt leads to gravel and so the guys that are out there on cruisers and things that don't ride gravel they're missing a lot of the best twisty pavement and in particular Colorado's got phenomenal twisty pavement we got a chance to ride a lot of it uh, connecting sections of, of the off-road portions of this route and so if you like riding twisties there's a lot of it on this route and it's a it's a blast Buena Vista, you kind of climb out and you get into some kind of 
scrub oak and some pinion trees, and then we dropped down into this sand basin. And I purposely didn't tell anyone about it because I didn't want them worrying about it. I just thought when they get there, they'll see the sand and they'll just have to get on the throttle and go. It's not very far, you know, it's maybe a half a mile of sand. Maybe should have told everyone about the sand. <laughs> Come to find out, we had a few sand mishaps, but everyone got through it just fine. It's fun, but it's a handful on a big bike to wrestle it through long sections of the sand like that. People should know that it's hard, but also, I mean, Tony got through it. You just put the outriggers out and paddle or push your bike through it. Stay on the edges sometimes. It's not quite as soft. If you haven't taken a course riding, then I would recommend taking a course and getting into some sand. Maybe trying out some of the obstacles you would expect on a big trip like this because one thing you don't want is to get out here and get over your head and feel bummed that you didn't make it or something like that so you know practice at home go find some sand go to a clinic something like that and then when you get to it you'll be way better prepared it feels of green and gold sun beating down on us hand in hand we walk we we'll watch as blackbirds flock time passing with the wind The camping we've done has been primarily, well, exclusively primitive camping, uh, undeveloped sites. Uh, we, we find the meadows, we find the forest, we find appropriate places to camp. The silence in the evenings is, is remarkable. The ability to just sit around quietly and have fun conversations, uh, relive the day and, and revisit the trip, you know, that's a pretty special experience to have. We're just above the town of Buena Vista and headed north. And I really don't know the route, uh, which is the first time for me because I knew the Washington and Utah so well before we did them. Uh, it's kind of a blessing for me, actually. I've, I'm enjoying just riding and not stressing so much about uh, all the planning parts of, of putting a BDR together. I gotta tell you, man, our guys from Colorado really know this state and they put together an incredible BDR. Every one of us is kind of blown away by this. So uh, anybody else who's gonna ride it com coming from anywhere, uh, US or internationally, they're gonna really love this. The Backcountry Discovery Route projects have been uh, my big trip of the year for three years now. Backcountry discovery routes are a good option because someone has done most of the work getting the route together, getting a map together, and in some cases getting a DVD together so you can see what it's like along the ride. You can plan them in the winter time and uh, get ready, get all excited about it, and, and uh, we look forward to this. The whole idea of a BDR, it's, it's you get out of it what you put into it. So you leave behind work, leave behind all this stuff. Even if you live in the state where the BDR is taking place, my guess would be you're gonna not generally see all this different terrain through a normal ride you do from your hometown, wherever. So on a trip like this, you're seeing so much different terrain, you get to absorb it all if you put yourself in that frame of mind to just sort of relax and take it all in. You know, it's, it's like if life had a refresh button, the BDR is a really good way to hit that. Today was a good day. It was um, a lot of fast riding, very scenic riding, uh, a few challenging spots, going over Hagerman Pass, up those rocky stretches, and I was really gratified to see that I was able to do, uh, ride the kind of train that we rode.
Today we started um, in Gypsum. It's a good point to grab some fuel and grab some food. There's a gas station and a grocery store right there, so it makes it really handy. But uh, right out of Gypsum, the the terrain completely changes from anything we've seen before. You start to get into um, this kind of clay soil and these kind of bizarre cliffs that are um, almost Utah-like, uh, you know, just very deserty. And um, uh, we climb up out of that and then get into some high meadows uh, a little bit. And then we dump back down into uh, what's called the uh, Colorado River Road. and. The road goes right along the Colorado River, and it's a smooth, really relaxing kind of road uh, that was really kind of fun just to kind of just sit there and go, wow, this is, this is really cool. You know, we have red rocks on this side, and we have the Colorado River on this side, and uh, it, was, it was really something. Some of the roads in this part of the state uh, are muddy when it rains and so this time of year when it dries out you end up with these ruts so it's a little dicey in some of the sections. The southern half of the state it was rocky 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 there was very few ruts and, and leftovers from the muddy season but up here there are not very many rocks but there is a lot of mud in the rainy season and so it turns into ruts so the ruts are a little sketchy on the big bikes. From there we took up and um, dropped down into an area called State Bridge which was uh, a bridge that crossed the Colorado River. It just kind of has this name of the State Bridge. Had some lunch there um, at this kind of hippie joint uh, that has these outside concerts, a uh, little venue with yurts and teepees. And so if you ever want to stay there, it's kind of an interesting place to stay. Uh, instead of camping, you can go stay in a yurt one night or a teepee uh, instead of just being out in your tent. So that's kind of cool. Had a little bit of a dirt road earlier today, had some highway riding here, um, some nice little twisties, really good road. Um, having lunch outside of the State Bridge right now. Loving life. It's good stuff. Great riding. There's a lot of different, I mean, you, a lot of valleys, a lot of big fields, a lot of great dirt roads, but then also like there's a really great section of just trails through the woods that was just a blast. It was just, just had a great time riding today, a lot of fun. I really had no idea how diverse and beautiful Colorado was. I mean, I, I'd heard how great Colorado was, but until you see it like this, you just don't, there's a whole new appreciation that I have for the state and for just, just riding motorcycles out here and being able to have access to, the, to these types of uh, roads and trails and views and, and just being free like this. It's one thing to have challenge, it's another to have a really hard time that really detracts from the reason I'm out here. The reason I'm out here is sort of fun. I made a misjudgment. I followed a group of riders who are very skilled up a little two track that was a, a cut across a, a switchback. And uh, I paid a price, I went down on it. Um, and I took a very hard fall, hurt my shoulder, and the injury haunted me for the rest of the day. <laughs> That's an example of riding beyond your comfort zone. But I thought I'd give it a try. It's the only way you get better. You know, for a moment there, I exercised bad judgment. I overestimated my ability for a moment, and I could have paid a high price. It could have impacted the whole trip. I think you picked a bad line. I always find it better to stay all the way left or all the way right. Usually in the middle there, that's where the big rocks and big holes are. So I always stay to the outside. That's my tip. Take a second. Man. My shoes are on top. When I was here scouting the route, it was deep on the right hand side, but the left hand side was maybe two feet deep. Now, what we're going to do is uh, see if we can't get across it. So, we're just scouting a way across, and it looks like kind of further left here is the ticket. But I went on the right side of the stump last time, but it's really shallow right there. Well, we're here to water crossing. Our strategy has been to have one of our colleagues walk across to see where the shallowest area is and just to see how deep it is. And so Bryce volunteered and went through. We're gonna try and stay close to the stump and make it through and hopefully everybody stays up. The deepest part 
was probably three feet. I would guess, well, it was a little higher than Bryce's knees when he went in there. And so it was a little tricky, but uh, Tom and I think Bryce went down and removed a few twigs on the dam uh, and let a little bit of water out so it wasn't so deep, but uh, it was fun. Tonight we rolled into this campsite here in the, on the meadow looking over a valley and we started cooking dinner and we were, uh, we were actually lucky enough to have some steaks and it was, it was ironic that a, a bunch of cows kind of came down through behind while we were sitting there <laughs> cooking our steaks and they kind of looked at us and just kind of kept passing through but it's kind of funny, a, a few of the different BDRs that we've been on, we've had cows show up while we're eating dinner and it's always, it's always funny. It's been a great six days so far. We've had incredible views, incredible riding, um, some, you know, good camaraderie, um, and it's been fun. It's been really a, a good time. It's been a real learning experience. I think I'm coming away from this whole experience with a much greater appreciation, not just for Colorado, but for the Northern Rockies, but certainly a, a tremendous appreciation for the privileges we have embodied in public lands. As Americans, we're very, very privileged to have this great concept of publicly owned wildlands. And, that, and that's what makes the BDRs possible in each of the states where, where they exist currently, is the existence of public lands. plan is to maybe head into Steamboat for breakfast, which is also a really great thing. People, you know, you see us camping all the time and it seems like we're just living off the land, but you can camp and wake up in the morning and head into an awesome ski town like Steamboat and have a omelet and a cup of coffee and then, you know, finish the last section in a few hours, which is what we'll do. The end of the uh, Colorado BDR ends up at the Three Rivers Ranch. When we got to the Three Rivers Ranch, you know, we were all kind of congratulating each other just because, you know, you, you've just done 749 miles uh, in a number of days and just the trials and tribulations from guys going down and helping them, bikes breaking down. And, um, and getting through stuff that uh, is maybe challenging at times, and then just enjoying the scenery and the camp together. Uh, it's, a, it's just a great feeling to get to the end and just say, wow, we've done it. We finally have finished the Colorado BDR. We've ver verified the route, we've done it, we've shown that it can be passable, and we've, we've done it on our own as an expedition, so it's met all of our criteria. One thing about this trip is I can't really think of a low point. E everything was just so good about crossing this state. The Colorado BDR, I think a lot of people will, when they're done, say it is the best, but uh, it's, it's, it's about the character of the state. Colorado just happens to have a lot of character. To me, this group ride really embodies in a small, compressed way, the sense of community, the bond that is adventure motorcycling. It's like no other I've ever experienced. I very much now look forward to turning this over to the community, to seeing people that come up to me in trade shows or in industry events and say, man, I went out and did that route. And so that's really what I'm looking forward to. So yeah, hell yes, I'm very happy to be done with this one and very much look forward to sharing it with the community. up was amazing just because it was so tight and switchbacky. Switchbacky a word. <laughs> so after I went through the switchbackification. <laughs> Camping and dumping in the rain. Horrible. Awful. My name is Paul Gillian. I'm the president of the backcountry. I'm oh, sorry. I screwed it up. It'll be in my ear. So we just left Ore, how do you pronounce it? Ure. So after we left Telluride, we went uh, up this, this nice canyon towards, uh, I forgot the name of the goddamn thing again, Ophir Pass. Okay, let me start over. Too broad of a question. Shall we do this over again? <laughs> no, 
<laughs> the five words that I would choose to describe this route is the best ride in the country. Is that five? <laughs> Up. Yeah. Sterling's an interesting fella. You know, he's kind of got that European, uh, Hispanic, American, Swedish, Filipino flair to him that you can't really figure out. It's <laughs> not. <laughs> Sorry. Let <laughs> me take a deep breath. Hope he didn't hear that. So right now we're in Pitkin. Uh, we started this morning in Los, on the pass of Los Penas. <laughs> he said penis. So anyway, arms broke. Let's go riding. That's the way to do it.